One day we had a we had a Looney Tunes promotion and we were re it was myself, Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, and I don't remember who else it was, but we were racing golf carts on pit road, and I'll never forget it because racing, racing, racing. Whoop! Jeff Gordon out the other side of the golf cart. <laughs> dude, dude fell out the out the out the right side of the golf cart. Welcome to Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour, presented by NASCAR on Fox. I'm Kevin Harvick, Caitlin Bency, Mama Smith. We're here to break it all down again for you this week. Somehow they just keep letting us come back. Yeah. So <laughs> apparently everything must be going okay. It must be. Episode 11. Can you guys believe that? Is it really? Yeah. That's that what this quick. paper says. We're in eight. You're out of fingers. You look at yeah. He's like, I'm back to my thumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need to go to the toes. But yeah. uh, speaking of toes, your, your shoes... Yeah, you like crispy. them. They are sharp. Yeah, yeah they're crispy this week. Yeah, I, well, you know, I, I told Boyer this this weekend again because I, I've been wearing a different pair to the racetrack too. It's now it's just a game. It and is I've a game. Everything's a game. It's just a game, and and Clint's shoes look like he's been mowing the yard with him, and now he's <laughs> backpedaling on on what his shoes look like. So those look brand new, yeah. like they are. full white, like very clean. I usually wear them wear them one time before I come here, so just to okay. make sure. to break yeah. them in, just yeah. to make sure they got a, they have a little dirt on them. But it's just a game. Just a game. Okay. Well, yeah. Speaking so, of games, speaking of games, make sure you continue to follow us on social media on X, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Subscribe to us as well. Follow Harvick Happy Pod so you can keep up with everything we have going on with the show. And there's a lot of kerfuffling on this show, right? Yeah, what there's a lot saying? of yeah, yeah. Uh, Kevin, um, <laughs> great job. Thank you. Oh my gosh! I, seriously, I, thanks. I feel <laughs> like we we caught everyone off guard this week. Like we were using you know newer urban words, and we we go back. We turned the clocks back, and got a nice Ken Squire one in there. So let's roll the tape. Let's hear it. Whoa! Oh, Kobayashi and Stenhouse. Now well, we got quite the kerfuffle right there. <laughs> quite what? the what? What'd you say? Kerfuffle. That's a Ken Squire <laughs> term. That must go back, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Well, it's my word of the week, so well, all right. there you go. So that's, that's my, the, the best part is, is my joy and, and the awkward silence there for a second because, like you say, you mixed it up a little bit yeah. and now it's it was more of an old school word. You're not, about it now. Yeah, yeah. I so I, I feel like um, when you sent the definition this week, I was going to be way more comfortable with the word. I'd never heard the word kerfuffle. <laughs> Uh, but apparently, Ken Squire has used that word uh, in many broadcasts uh, throughout the years. So, good choice. Was that a fan submitted that one? That was a, yeah, that, that was, was a, a fan, fan submission. So, thanks so, for the submission. Good. Yeah, we're, sure. keep sending them. Keep sending them. Give us the five star reviews and leave in the comment because we might pick your, or well, you might pick. He's yeah. in charge of the selections. I, I am in charge of the selections. And I felt like really good about that one. And you used it multiple times. Well, you, we you used, used it multiple twice? times. Yeah, I did, I did use I it twice. Used it again, and I think Clint and Mike used it a couple times. So, it, it became, it became a, became a fun word to use. And we didn't have many uh, situations to use the word. Kerfuffle. I was going to say, I thought there'd yeah. be more. more. Yes, we I did. thought we'd have more. Yeah. I thought we'd get it out of the way right off the bat in turn one. Yeah, it didn't happen. Didn't, didn't happen. happen. Real quick though, what was Mike's face like? when? Yeah. You, cause I can it's hear it pause. in his voice. That he's I can't look at him. I can't look at he or Clint. <laughs> when I'm using the word, I can. I have to look at the screen. I have to block <laughs> them out because if I look at them, I I, I just have this feeling that it's going to result in hysterical laughter. And yeah. We won't be able to. We won't be able to cover the race okay. correctly. Oh. Fair. He did a great job. You said you're like a little stressed sometimes picking these words I am now because little... he like he really thinks about like how you're gonna deliver it and what, what is it gonna work? Is it, it matters? <laughs> it it matters. does matter. It's a team. It's a team aspect, and I, I got to put the ball where it needs to be for him to keep running and score the touchdown. Yeah, every time I every time on Friday afternoon, early evening, whenever that text come, I'm <laughs> always like, oh man. Here we go. What am I in what for this now? week? But yeah. people are loving one. it. Yeah. And we've had even other drivers giving you some props and compliments. Raja Karuth posted a nice tweet about you being up in the booth oh, saying cool. what a great job you're doing yeah. and giving some there props. He screen. says, Kevin Harvick has been straight up awesome in the booth this year, which, yeah, I would have to agree with that for sure. Well, I appreciate that. We're, we're having fun. And everybody's, I mean, the whole Fox team is is doing a good job. And, and I'm fortunate to be able to have just got out of the car, got oh, it, yeah. went straight into the booth. So it's been fun to learn what 
uh, I'm supposed to be doing in the booth and Clint, <laughs> Mike and everybody on the team has been great to, to help and help me through that process. But it's also fun to be able to kind of teach the differences between what's happening with the new car and, and the old car. So it's been yeah. fun. You've been great. You are a natural. That's for sure. All right. Let's talk about this race though that unfolded out there in Austin, Texas. Treetop thoughts. What did you think? Uh, there wasn't any cautions. <laughs> um, I, I think from practice to qualifying to the race, I thought that it was going to be the 54 and the 20. And then William Byron qualified on the pole and took off. And I'm like, oh, I kept telling Clint, I'm like, he's going to he's gonna start to fall back and the Toyotas are, are going to start to march forward. And, and Tyler Reddick actually went backwards. Mm -hmm. And... William Byron never missed a beat, man. He was mm -hmm. he was on point though from start to finish and and put together a perfect race. So I guess that really shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, last year they kind of fumbled a little bit and got got beat there at the end of the race. Uh, this year he did a great job managing his gap, making sure that if they had had to go longer into the race that they had enough fuel. Everybody was tight on fuel at the way that the strategy worked out. Um, I was um, turn eight was dirty. Yeah. What was up with that? Yeah, everybody. Well, they repacked all the, they repacked the dirt before the race where the trench was dug in the day before uh, through, through turn eight. And um, it was all back out on the mm. racetrack before mm. it was all said and done. So it was a, that was a treacherous corner. Um, and then we saw just, we saw just a great race by, by William Byron. And, and I think it's, um, he doesn't get a lot of the credit that he deserves. Mm -mm. And I think for, for me, the, the more I just watch what they do from last year to this year, you just see that consistency on super speedways, on mm -hmm. road courses, on short tracks, mile and a half. They're just in the mix. And, and you know, he's just a consistent contender. And, and I think that's just the way it's going to be from here forward. Yeah, I mean, I had to wear the... I was going to you know, say... You yeah, this is a 1995 nice Jeff Gordon. It's very change. fitting. William it Byron is. is the first driver since Jeff Gordon to win multiple races over the last three years. He's the first one over the last three years to win two races. Really? Yeah, last oh, guy like to the, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first 24, to, 23, yeah. 22, William Byron was the first to win multiple win, races. You. And Jeff Gordon was the, the, the last one That's to do that. That's a good nugget you got there. Yeah. He, he's a true broadcaster. Thank you, Larry sure Mack. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, Mack. Yeah, so, you know, we got, we got some William we Byron gear William here. Byron you know, we got to give him the, you got to give him his props. But like, I think, what William did was super impressive. I mean, he he's been kind of on this upward trend over the last two years, and like yes. it hasn't stopped, it hasn't slowed down. They had like a little bit of a hiccup of over the last couple of weeks, but you can't win them all. I told William behind the stage, I'm like, "How's it going?" He's like, "Man, we just got to get this thing back on track." I said, "Brother, you can't win them all." Like I know when you when you get to winning like six, then you feel like you should have won eight because you can think of the ones that you didn't win, but. Just, just go back to doing your thing. And he did that. He put it on the pole. I said to him, I said, this one's for Max. He's like, I know Max is happy. Max <laughs> Pappas. Yeah. Been working with, with William on his road course stuff. So, well, pretty impressive. Well, let's not, let's not let that go too far. You talk about Max Pappas. And I met William. I think he was probably 15 years old with Max Pappas. And, and he said, hey, this is, this is William. Uh, here's what we're doing. Here's our plan. Here's where we're going. Here's what we're going to do next. They've always had a plan. William and Max have, and and William's father, uh, they've always worked very well together. And when I went to the go kart track, just for instance, this last week, I got there Wednesday to to pick up Keelan, and um, here comes William walking out of the go kart track, and and that's not abnormal. William's at the at the kart track a lot, but they they have a system that is that works well for William with the coaching and the style and uh, that circle of life that William has with his family and and how they operate. It just it works and it's smooth yeah. and and well it's a well oiled machine and and William Byron's work ethic sticks out uh, glaringly sticks out compared to a lot of his competitors and the things that he does and and how hard he works because in my opinion Williams Williams um, he's a gifted person but I don't know that he was uh, even if he was a gifted race car driver with natural ability. He didn't recognize it until he was much later in into Life. his teens right. than most. So for him to catch up and be where he is today is a lot of work and and requires a lot of time and effort to make up those those gaps that he had from on track experience and and the things that he was doing and from when he started racing in in his mid teens. So I think that that is that is an important note to 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 note that 
whether it's William, his father, or Max and their whole system, they've made up a lot of ground in a short amount of time. He's very much been a student of the sport, for sure. I know you have some interesting numbers, a comparison between William Byron and his teammate at Hendrick, Kyle Larson. What stands out to you the most about these numbers and tell the story? So it's really (laughs) interesting to look at the 78 races in the next-gen car that William Byron and Kyle Larson have, have run together, okay? So... Right off the bat, everybody, I, I, I think, thinks, hey, Kyle Larson is head over heels better than his teammates. He's won more races. He's got more top tens. He's, like, it's not even close, right? Wrong. Um, <laughs> well, oh, nope. uh, wrong. Yeah. So they, they have the same amount of starts. They have the same amount of poles over those 78 races. William Byron has won 10 races, and Kyle Larson has won eight. Um, seconds, you know, they're close. Uh, top fives, they're close. Top tens, they're close. DNFs. And this is where the debate really started for yeah. me. Is Kyle Larson has 16 DNFs and William Byron has nine. Lead lap finishes. William Byron has 63. Uh, Kyle Larson has 56. So the thing that I just wanted to point out, they're both great, but they're both very different. Kyle Larson, naturally gifted, will win in anything fast. William Byron works hard, fast again, can win in anything in, in stock car racing for, for sure at the highest level. But it, there's also that piece of the puzzle in races that are four, five, 600 miles long that requires you to finish. And I think that's still some of Kyle Larson's weaknesses. He makes those mistakes in, it, in, in some of those races, racing too hard, spinning himself out, running into the wall, whatever it may be. And he costs himself uh, more opportunities to win. And I think William has been the opposite. He's capitalized on some of those situations where the Kyle Larson incident, incident comes in or something happens and he's a fifth place car and winds up having a good pit stop or putting himself in position to win by keeping himself in the mix and running all those laps and not having as many DNFs. And, and so in NASCAR racing, it's not all about being fast. I guess that's my, my biggest point right. here because they're both great. They're just different. Yeah, they're they're different. And I think that's been Kyle Larson since Kyle Larson started racing stock cars. Like, he's been fast, and he's going to put you in a situation to win a lot of races. He also might lose a lot of races because he's going so hard. It's kind of, we talked about it off set here. I was like, it's kind of like Lamar Jackson. (laughs) Lamar Jackson is a super talent and badass. But if you tell him to stop running the football— right it's going to take away an element of him. And if you tell Larson, hey, I want you to stop running so many dirt races or these other things, mm-hmm. it's going to take some of his edge away. You, you just got to keep feeding that because he is a dog. Yeah. <laughs> really hard to got beat. Got that dog. Yeah. And I think that the other interesting part is we're talking about uh, Hendrick's top two drivers, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, these are, and it's not, one of them is not Chase Elliott. What do you make of that? Because we were talking, like you said, offset a little bit about Chase Elliott. And it's been just, it doesn't seem like he's been the same since he came back from that injury necessarily. Yeah, or do you think it's well, more of this car? Well, we, we, we interviewed Chase Elliott this weekend on, on the pre-race. And, and uh, Chase has been very open about where he thinks he is with this particular car and, and the things that, that come with um, driving this car differently. And we went to Coda this weekend, and it's back at a road course where we expect Chase Elliott, have come to expect Chase Elliott to be in the front and dominate. But listening to, to Chase talk about his own uh, situation uh, in the pre-race, the one thing that he talked about was the, was the difference in the braking. And for me, that was a very hard situation to overcome as well because in the old car, you had to manage the car. You had to manage the situation. As the, as the tires would wear out, the brakes would, would get hot and, and things would start to change. Wheel hop would, would start to be an issue in the back of, of the old car. So there was a technique, which was also what made it hard for uh, the Kobayashis and uh, SVGs and those types of, of people to, to come over. And, and that's why you never saw a road course ringer win a race right. because of the, the unique style that it took to drive uh, a NASCAR Cup Series car or, a, or an Xfinity car or a truck. Um, and as you'll see later, what, what an open wheel guy does to a rear <laughs> housing. Um, oh, yeah. So <laughs> it, it is, um, you know, I think that that technique is much different now uh, with the transaxle in the back, uh, no truck arms anymore. Uh, and there is no wheel hop anymore. You can slide the rear tires under braking, uh, but it's a much more aggressive style of braking. And as we saw this weekend, 
every single lap, it's an aggressive style braking. The cars, you have to drive them way into the corner. You have to use more brake pressure and the style of braking that you, and how you let off the brake is, is much different than it used to be. The way that it, the, the rack and pinion feels and turns compared to the steering box. None of that is how Chase Elliott was, was brought up. And Caitlin, you mentioned this uh, before we started the show. Um, you look at a kid like William Byron, you know, he's, he's what, got five years of, of cup experience, yeah. maybe four and years remember bef- one, before was, this car? It was one, 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 two on his way up. Yeah. It wasn't like he raced a whole lot. It was one right. year next, so one year you, next. So you just don't have as much history of having to relearn how to drive the, the next-gen car. And we heard Tyler Reddick talk about it in his interview uh, last week on, on, this, on this show. Um, you know, it was a great time for him to reset with the next-gen car coming in because it was so different. He could adjust his style to that car, but he was doing the exact same thing that everybody else had to do to adjust to the new car and learn the new car. So I think it's different. I think, um, you know, there's just a lot of things that that come with uh, this car that you have to do differently. And, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a high level of work and commitment that comes to being around this car in the shop, in the simulator. Um, and I think uh, William Byron is a great example of, of, of being able to outwork your competition. Yeah, he's one of the hardest working guys in the garage. And he's like in the sim, whether it's at the Chevy uh, joint or just at his own house. Like he's mm-hmm. just constantly working on it. And I think it's interesting. Chase said that because I was talking to Kyle Bush behind the stage and I'm like, you have intermittent speed, I feel like. Yeah, I'm like, one one run. Same scenario. Yeah, same, same deal. Same I'm same like, scenario. one run, you're going to the front and then he's like, yep. And then the next run, we're junk. He's like, what I was great, what made me great and made me who I was in the old car. I can't do all those things here. Yeah. He's like, it's a challenge. And they, I think these guys are accepting the challenge and they're going to figure it out because they're great. But it's interesting to see who has. But you got to reset your clock. Your circle of life has to be different with this car. Mm. Uh, I'm telling you, you have to, it takes more time and more work and more effort to be good at this because the increments in how you do things, they're smaller. Um, it's harder to find speed. And I think um, for a Kyle Busch, uh, for Chase Elliott, uh, you have to figure out how to spend more time doing what you're doing mm-hmm. uh, to, to find and figure out the details of the race car. Because Kyle, for example, and I was the same way. So it's not, you, you, with the old car, you didn't have to do anything right? You could go to the simulator and in five minutes you could say, yep, we need to do this, this, and this, or we could go to the racetrack. We get done with the first run. Brakes don't feel right. You know, this is wrong. That's wrong. Uh, we need to work on the ride. Not the case, uh, for Kyle Busch anymore because, uh, of everything that has changed. And Kyle Busch was always the one that could do and tell you everything that was wrong with that car in one run. Mm -hmm. That was it. And once, once he was done with that and, and we switched to the next gen car, all those things that he was talking about are irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. all new. That's all new lingo and all new conversation. Is this irrelevant at all? Also, so much less practice time than you guys used to have. Is that play into this at all? Because I remember when Kyle Busch was first talking about this new car, he's like, and we don't practice like we used to. There's yeah. just less time. Yeah, well, that's what that's Kyle's strength you know, mm-hmm. is being able to you know, diagnose the car and be able to, to work things out by just telling you what was wrong. Uh, you didn't have to go and sit with the engineers and the crew chief and say, "Hey, you know, this is doing that." You think it's you think it's aero? Do you think it's suspension? Do you think it's the springs, the shocks? What is it? And that box is smaller, so you know to to get all those details right takes takes a lot of time. So I think it's um, you know, it's going to be an interesting to to see who switches it up and and who really figures it out because it's um, I mean, Martin Truex has has been right in the middle of it, but. You know, I think his team has also helped bridge that gap in trying to figure some of those things out too, because the cars are fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think it it you know it's different when you're in Kyle's situation where you're trying to help figure out how to make the cars better too, when you don't really know exactly what pushes the button on this car. So we're talking about Kyle Busch incident between him and Christopher Bell in this race. What did you think about what you saw here? I think you could you could probably. I, I mean, I'm gonna I'll let you let you see it here. Um, you know, I think Bell had committed to fill in that hole, and Kyle, um, with that late move, I, I don't know the the, the spotter conversation, um, but Bell had definitely decided that that he was going to fill the hole, and and uh, Kyle probably looked in the mirror and didn't think that that was going to happen. But you can see right there what was going to happen. Um, 
and Christopher was at a point of no return right there. So I, I look at that as just one of those racing deals perfectly. I think, I think Kyle's frustrated uh, with the way that they've run and having a decent day right there. He still wound up having a, a decent day, but I think, I think in general, Kyle is just frustrated with the way that the start of the year has gone. And I think right. you're starting to see more of those situations boil over. And Christopher actually genuinely looked scared there, I thought. When Kyle caught him off guard. Him, him like, off guard. Well, Christopher's <laughs> never like got into it with anybody. Right. Like, and they were teammates yeah. and Kyle gave him a shot at KBM. Yeah, he yeah. kind of came through that Toyota, like mm-hmm. you got to go through Kyle's <laughs> program. Yeah. And so there's a respect level that's different, right? Because Kyle's made so many guys so good. Right. And Christopher's one of them. And Christopher's Absolutely. never got into it with anyone. It's kind of like Larson, too. Like, Larson's never really got into it with anyone except one time with Bubba. Like, But, like, his oh. face is like, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, Uncle Kyle is, is real. Mad. Upset. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Like, he didn't know what to do. And Kyle, you, like, Kyle, he's like, he puts his finger up two and then three. Mm-hmm. And, like, we don't have the audio on that, but it, it looks like he's like, it feels like something like where it's like you hit me once, once you hit me twice yes, yep. somewhere else, and now you wreck me and you know. So And I always find these as interesting scenarios because you you always wonder, like I wonder now, you it makes me think about how is Christopher Bell gonna react? Because he also spun Kyle Larson out too. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we had the Ross Chastain stuff uh, over the over the last couple of years and and you look at those scenarios and and when you got to a certain point, I felt like it affected the way that he drove and the things that the decisions that he made. Um, and sometimes a guy like Kyle, that's why he's going to do that, right? Because he's like, well, I need to, I need to get this situated and tell my piece or mix this up or whatever. Mm-hmm. You never know what, what somebody's thinking, but um, you always wonder how it affects somebody in, in those types of situations and, and what happens going forward when they're racing around Kyle Busch or Kyle Larson. Just do they push it like yeah. they did like right. he did on this particular day or does it does he have to second you know think about that twice and and not stuff it in there like he should and yeah. did i think i think with Kyle Bush specifically like because of what you just said with their season not being super stellar the more that it stays mid to not that mm-hmm. great the more that Kyle Busch is going to do this. Right. Because yeah. he already has a problem with how everyone races each other anyway. Oh, yeah. And now he's now he's like, okay, we're having a decent day, and I get run over. Now I'm going to go down here and say something to you. I think more of the old Rowdy is going to kind of start showing sure. back up with where they're at. Because he's frustrated. Because he's mm-hmm. mad. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to see how that story continues to unfold between Christopher and Kyle. Uh, I want to let you talk about Ty Gibbs again. <laughs> No, well, because, <laughs> I want to let you talk about well, him. Honestly, we're going to keep talking about him because he's done so well. It really is impressive. But I heard you talking, I think it was in qualifying or something. You're like, I'm not surprised, though, that he's running this well on the road course. No. He, he's he been a great road course racer since the first time that we've seen him on the racetrack. Mm-hmm. And, right. and when you listen to the things that he's done in the past with the, the Trans Am car and all the K and N races or um, ARCA races, whatever they call it now. I, think, <laughs> I guess it's ARCA. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, I, I can still call it Winston West. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're way behind. Yeah, so don't worry about way it. Date myself. Yes, those are cigarettes. <laughs> uh, so it's um, it doesn't surprise me. I, I think their their cars are really good on the road courses. He's put a lot of time into trying to be good at the road courses, and and um, he should have been on the. He was right at being on the pole, he actually had to lift way before the start finish line because he got way too wide uh, coming to the temporary start finish line. And it's super rough out there. And I think he knew that uh, and he didn't want to destroy his car or have anything happen. And he actually lifted way before the start finish line and still only missed by just a, just a little bit. So, um, but I, I honestly thought that he was the car to beat uh, when we got done with practice and William Byron just, didn't have anything, didn't want to have anything to do with that conversation because he showed from the drop of the green flag that I'm the car to beat. Yes, he so did. Still, still um, a solid day for Christopher Bell, a solid day for um, uh, Ty Gibbs. And, you know, Denny Hamlin was, he got a stage point. He was, he was there. Uh, and Martin Truex wrecked on the first lap, first corner Dude. Uh, with Corey yeah. Joy and somebody else, that, Busher. Did, that wreck, so they're three wide coming off of turn one. And, like, obviously, Martin's there. But, like, what are we doing on turn one, lap one? Well, I, I think a lot of that just happened because they all went wide. Corey was way wide. Martin just was like, hey, I'm in a safe spot. 
<laughs> I'm just going to drive straight right here. And Corey had abruptly yeah. turned the car from going through the grass. Yeah. Because that asphalt is wide, but it gets really narrow. Real quick. Real quick. And, yeah. and it was either go through the grass or pull it back onto the racetrack. And he just yanked it back on the racetrack and slammed into Martin. And Martin slammed into Bubba. Uh, into Bubba. So it was... Um, it was just one of those unfortunate, untimely things. You gotta give it to Bubba though, because they came all the way back. They ended up fifteenth, and he's not. If you ask him, he's not a road course yeah. guy. Yeah. If I do not mention Austin Green from the Xfinity race, he had a top ten. That's David Green. Oh, good. Yeah, that's David Green's kid. And David was David was in his <laughs> official uniform. Yeah, he's like, well, that's I think everything's awesome, good. Man. He kept getting on the box, like, how's he doing? You know what I mean? Like, tell me your dad without telling me your dad. Yeah, yeah that is so that. cool. That's awesome. Yeah. You referenced Corey LaJoy just a moment ago. We saw him very winded after the race, had to go to the infield care center. Can you describe what it's like racing at that track and why it's so physically taxing? Yes, it is very physically taxing because it's, um, <laughs> last year was the same way, just a super long last run. So you run, you know, half the race under green and you shift 24, 25 times a lap. Um, you know, you're 11, 1200 pounds of brake pressure going into turn one, turn 10, turn 11, or I guess it would have been turn 11, turn 12, um, 19, 20. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of bumps. It's a very bumpy racetrack. So it's just, you're, you're getting, you're getting the crap beat out of you all day, jumping over the curbs. And, you know, Corey LaJoy happened to be right outside of our broadcast booth. We were looking right over it and he got out of the car and kind of fumbled around for a minute and went over to the other side of the car and laid down. Josefar was, you know, same thing beside his car. Uh, Bubba was was gassed. Uh, saw Blaney come walking out. I mean, all of them they just looked, looked completely exhausting. smashed. Yeah. Uh, and that's how I felt after this race last year: completely smashed. And it's just a, <laughs> it's just a taxing day. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I couldn't do it. There's no doubt about that. There's a lot of you're just a lot going on there. Around yeah, the yeah. yeah. So one question that was posed: Are track limit rules good or bad? I'm curious what you think on this. Uh, one. I I just I, I talked to SVG a little bit about this this weekend, and he's like, mate. Hadn't been, anywhere, hadn't, been any, <laughs> hadn't been anywhere in the whole world where I could race off the track more than I could race on the track. And I think, you know, from a, from a purest road racing standard, um, I just, I believe that we need to race on the track. I think that Coda would actually race better if we had track limits. Mm. Uh, NASCAR's point is, hey, we're not, we're not to the point of being able to officiate it yet. Um, they need to hurry up. <laughs> and we, need to, we need to officiate every corner on a road course like it needs to be officiated. And I think that track limits will make every road course a better racetrack, even like at Sonoma, when you go from turn four and you blow over the curb and over into, into seven, um, you know, if you officiated that corner and had those guys not blow over the curb, it's actually going to be a better race because more guys are going to get tight or get loose or go over the curb or whatever that might be. Um, and you know, the way that that's officiated in most every other series is, Hey, if you blow the track limits on the third time, you get a penalty, you get two warnings. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a tough scenario because NASCAR can't, isn't in a position to really officiate it correctly. And I think that taking all the curbs out at Coda probably seemed like a good idea. Uh, the turtles create problems because if you hit them with the underbody of the car, it just tears the underbody of the car up. Yep. So there has to be something to deter the drivers um, delicately, like just enough to keep them from going too far over the curbs. But it'd be way easier if we just officiate it. And, and then the turn eight situation and the jumping of the cars goes away. There's just a lot of things that it saw, would solve if we could just officiate it correctly. I like what you just said about you get a couple warnings. Yeah. I like that because this situation is where it like, happened to AJ in the Xfinity race. Mm -hmm. He was coming through the S's. And like they're racing hard, and then you like kind of get offline, and there's no bringing it back like enough to not yeah. get the penalty. And that obviously it ruined his day. Like that was at the end of the race, ruins your day. So if there's like something in between where it's like, okay, you, you know, you did it, but if you're egregious with it, then it should just be a penalty. Yeah. I, I don't like giving the making the officials have to officiate but so much, but this situation. Yeah, and and NASCAR actually uh, had a system this week to help them officiate the S's with cameras, much like they do the, the pit boxes. Uh, they just didn't have enough to to do the whole racetrack, but uh, we need to get to that point pretty quick <laughs> and and officiate it and and have these these road courses have that runoff there to keep the dirt and everything <laughs> off the racetrack, not have cars racing out there. Yeah. So. I mean, Coda is a racetrack that you can put different height and different styles of curbs in every corner. The track's actually designed for that. 
And the first year we went there, we had big orange turtles uh, in, in the middle of the corner. But when we went to the next gen car, people just felt like, you know, that those curbs were too dangerous uh, for the bottom of the, of the car with the full floor pan. So, uh, I, you know, I think we, we need small deterrent curbs, not the big turtles like we had the first year, but it, it creates less dirt in eight. You don't jump it in nine. You're not jumping it in, in, um, any of the other corners and yeah. you're not going off the racetrack and, and like off of turn one at Coda off of, um, I guess, turn nine at Coda, super rough. Uh, I think they fixed the exit of nine, but in the past has been, has been super rough. So you really don't want to be out there, but you have to go out there because it makes time, but it's brutal on your body and the car. Everyone's getting better too at road course racing. Mm. This isn't like back in the day where everyone was like, I'm going to take this yeah. week off. Like everyone's like, yeah, pretty good at it now. You better so be. We yeah. have a lot you of have them to now. Be yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And and I think that the 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 tires it needs more fall off. Right, the yeah. the speed was just there wasn't enough fall off to be able to force the guys into 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 pitting. So we're 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 a couple of years uh, we're a couple of years. I guess this is actually the third year at Coda with this car. Um, time to time to get the tire under control and and uh, make that thing wear out a little more. Road course is done for now. Now we're going mm -hmm. off to Richmond Raceway this weekend. Short track, more kerfuffles probably happening. More kerfuffles. I am sure that. You were a four-time winner there. Your first one came in 2006. Yeah. What what good memories you got of that place? Well, it's it's um, <laughs> w when I was at RCR, there was we never went to an Xfinity race there and didn't expect to, to win. Uh, we, we ran our first race at KHI there in a truck series. Mm -hmm. uh, 2001, we lost to Jack Sprague by about six inches. Uh, if I Were wouldn't have been driving? in so much trouble, I'd have stuffed his ass. But, <laughs> um, I was in so much trouble at that point, I wasn't going to breathe on it. <laughs> um, we actually, that funny story, uh, Todd Barrier and all the guys, they decided that, we decided that we were going to go truck racing. So we went and bought a chassis. We built that truck in Ed Barrier's garage at his house. That's awesome. That is after awesome. After work uh, in, in three weeks. And we took it in uh, Delana's dad's um trailer, his late model trailer. We took two uh, late model trailers and and this one truck that we had, we were putting the decals on at the racetrack. Nothing fit the templates, of course. And <laughs> Wayne Otten was the, was the inspector at the time. And he was finally, I think he was like, I don't even know what else to tell you to do to this thing. Just put it on a racetrack. But um, that was actually where we had our, our first outing in the, in the truck series. But it was always a racetrack where we expected to go and win while we were at RCR. We kind of struggled, honestly, at, at SHR more than more than yeah. I thought we would. Uh, Rodney doesn't did not like Richmond. really. Why? It was just one. He was just one of the track that he hated the most. And Whoa. so when I got to, when I got there, uh, you know, he had worked so much on on all the racetracks that I did bad on. I was like, all right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I've not been to Richmond too many times where I didn't expect to have a chance to to run well. Mm -hmm. We got to figure this out. So we wound up getting some good finishes and actually ran really well in the next gen car there. And he won there. Actually won my last mm -hmm. uh, career race there. Uh, in, in 22. So, uh, great, um, great times, uh, at, at Richmond and just a racetrack that is very technical, uh, wore out. Uh, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of, uh, green flag runs, probably green flag pit stops, but, um, yeah, that was, a that was a good place for me. Yes, it was. We just saw some video of you winning. Are those the same glasses? You got the same glasses on? No, that was the only that that that's the pair that was saved. Oh, the Chase Elliott okay. thing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's that's the same <laughs> pair of glasses that uh, almost Survived. had a, almost had a near they had a near death Dead. experience <laughs> <laughs> at Bristol. Uh, what do you like about Richmond? It's the first place I ever saw a cup race because I'm from Virginia, obviously. Oh yeah, I love going there. Uh, I always remember the Rock and Roll 400 mm -hmm. with uh, the Looney Tune cars. That yeah. man, like as a kid. <laughs> That's like right. that's like that like spoke right to my soul like I picked <laughs> I loved Bugs Bunny but I didn't like Jeff Gordon and he was Bugs Bunny was on Jeff's car yeah I had a real you didn't like man. Jeff Gordon yeah. like, <laughs> no no I was a Tony Stewart guy okay and, to and Tony had like I think he had like Yosemite Sam or Taz on it or whatever. I always had Taz on you my always car. had Taz I always. had the Taz yeah what do you know how that how that happened like do you know how that worked yeah how'd it work well, well, it was a Chevrolet promotion, so oh. Chevrolet in action. So they had a deal with uh, uh, Looney Tunes for for a oh, while, nice. and then it switched to the bands rock and roll yeah, yeah, yeah. after after Looney Tunes um, went away. So 
Yeah, we we uh, we always had a Tasmanian Devil car when was, when I when I first started. It was yeah. awesome. Like yeah. uh, everyone, if, if you ask any kid from the '90s, they remember <laughs> that, yeah. and they'll either have one diecast. Yeah, or like the the first win uh, that we had at KHI in the mm-hmm. truck, they actually moved the Looney Tunes program uh, to Phoenix. So um, yeah, I had the oh, really? I had all the Looney Tunes characters on on the truck. But you were always Tasmanian Devil on the cup car. Did shoe fit? Is the that, shoe fit. Perfect. They think they were. Yeah. I mean, they absolute, picked that one purposely. It was an absolute perfect fit. <laughs> they definitely did some of that. Like you can see, like they did some of that. Like on purpose. Yeah. Like, it was like a character. I thing. remember. I remember one day we had a we had a Looney Tunes promotion, and we were. Re- it was myself, Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, and I don't remember who else it was, but we were racing golf carts on pit road. Oh, boy. and we probably have the footage of this somewhere <laughs> here at Fox. But um, we were racing golf carts, and I'll never forget it because racing, racing, racing. Whoop. Jeff Gordon out the other side of the golf cart. <laughs> dude, dude fell out the out the out the right side of the golf cart. Oh, so geez. um that was that was pretty funny. That is funny. And yeah. we were looking at some other funny clips. Well, maybe you won't find them too funny. I think it's funny. A particular incident with Ricky Rudd. They're all funny at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when it happened. Like, would well, you it was that? it was somewhat funny. So we on the I had just passed Rudd. Um and at that particular point, I had made up like 400 and some points on Matt Kenseth. He had like a 600-point lead wow. in the points championship that mm. year. And I had made up a bunch of points in the previous weeks, and and I go in there, and Rudd just dumped me. And I felt like it was on purpose because we were in a position to to keep making up points that night, and, and that pretty much ended the championship chase that night. So I was pissed. Um <laughs> Got in trouble for running into his car. Got in trouble for stomping on his roof and his hood. And got in trouble for saying GD. Got in trouble <laughs> in the trailer. I think it cost me Man. it cost me like 150 grand. Or uh, Richard made me pay all the fines. That's the night that Mike Helton told us right. that we were responsible for the bench clearing brawl. Yeah, and you know that was as mad that was as mad as I've I've ever seen Mike. But um, the Wood Brothers had fun with it. They're, the hood is actually. In the, in the Wood Brothers Museum, they had mm-hmm. everybody sign it. That's cool. And they and they that kept the funny. kept the hood off the car. But you you see me climbing on the top of that car. And the reason that Ricky Rudd, one reason that Ricky Rudd is so mad after that, there might have been a Hans thrown, but I know for sure there was a, I know for sure there was a tire gauge that probably hit Ricky Rudd in the mouth. <laughs> I'm not sure who face. threw that, but I know that he was mad because he had been he had been hit in the mouth, and and that was my car chief. Uh, Kirk Almquist that that um, he was always the one to, to, <laughs> to keep me from to keep me from completely doing something too stupid. We got that was dumb. Uh, but the part that you didn't see, <laughs> that the part dumb. that you didn't see right there was Big Mike. He actually was in the in there as well. But he actually trained the whole damn car. I jumped on the uh, off the off the roof onto the hood. <laughs> and that's why the Wood Brothers kept the hood because their car didn't really have any damage until, until after the race. It needed a roof, a hood, side. They uh, the in the video, there's one of your crew guys. You pull up and you like hit him, and he's like, "What the?" <laughs> it is so funny. It was so. See, funny. that's the that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand, and I may have mentioned it on on this show before, but that's Richard Childress, man. People don't realize how wild and crazy Richard Childress is. I mean, he. He loves to have shit stirred up. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Richard Hold my Childress. Watch. Richard, yeah, he's going to punch watch. you in the oh, mouth. Classic. And line. he, at the racetrack, is as intense a dude as you're ever going to meet at the racetrack. He is a guy that is going to ask you to hold his watch so he can punch you in the mouth. And it is like that with everything. And he expects you to have that fire and enthusiasm about caring about winning or losing. And it is, a, it is an eye for an eye. If somebody runs you over, he expects you to run him back over ASAP and That's he is going to encourage it. And if they don't like it, they're going to fight. And he was, he was like, I don't care what you do. You go, you go do what you got to do and we'll take care of it. I think he always had your back and everybody on that team had that same mentality. I think it was at Bristol with Tyler Reddick and Chase Briscoe when they're Tyler was about to, he was in the lead or something. Briscoe ends up wrecking him or spinning him out at the end of the race and Kyle Busch wins the race. And Reddick goes down to talk to Briscoe, and Briscoe looked like he was get, uh, getting ready to get an earful like like Christopher Bell. Right. And he didn't. Tyler didn't. Tyler was just like, hey, man. like, mm. Yes. Happened. But yeah. you could see the crew guys. That was the beginning of the end. Yeah, you could see the crew guys, the RCR crew guys behind him like, 
and we were ready. We were ready to fight, and like yeah. they were ready to go. And Tyler isn't that guy, no. so that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, and and you know, I look at a guy like like Austin Hill, right? I mean, you saw what he, he is that guy. Yeah, he, he is that guy. Fired up and last week. Those are the guys. Those are the guys that that Richard Childress is really going to lean into and say, "That's my guy," mm-hmm. yeah. because that is Richard. Richard is competitive, fiery, and he is from a. He's an old school hardcore racer and that's how they when you when you took food off their table he, he was going to take food off your table <laughs> that is very funny you were probably a perfect fit for him then oh uh, we had you fun. went along right with it, it. Yeah. <laughs> i loved it i loved every minute of it <laughs> all right so richmond let's do some uh early predictions or who we think is going to be the guy the team who are we watching you guys i i think that it's a good opportunity for austin dillon Yes, I had him down too. I think it's a good opportunity for Brad Kozlowski, Kyle Busch, uh, to to just have a weekend. It's at one of their, just, <laughs> yeah. let's just have a decent weekend. Let's just finish the race. I know Brad, you know, he he kind of, with the strategy being flipped uh, earlier in the year, got a decent finish. They didn't run there. Uh, but I think this is a place that they, you know, he, him and uh, Chris Busher can can run well. Uh, Chris Busher's starting his 300th race this weekend. <laughs> Last guy to win on their 300th race? This guy? Brad Kozlowski. Oh, I thought it was you. Look um, at him dropping yeah. this today. And I, and I think uh, my yeah. pick is going to be Martin Truex. That's mine, too. I'm sorry. I went first. It's okay. <laughs> Great minds think alike. <laughs> okay. See, but I had okay. four down. I had four choices down to win. Well, I, Austin Dillon was written in our stats book as the sleeper because it's actually one of his better short tracks. And like yeah. Kevin said, he really needs something to go right. So it, it's just been dismal. Yeah. I, you guys know already that when I pick somebody, it doesn't go well. I picked Noah this I past week. Ty Gibbs oh, yeah. Week. That was a great pick. I mean, you definitely <laughs> didn't get the stats report. Didn't go well. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's I'm, not based on how much, how much uh, enthusiasm there is for somebody on Twitter. No, that's not the point. But there I got a lot of real support. Stats. Y'all supported me when I picked him, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I honestly, I'm gonna go with a Hendrick car. I'm gonna go with the 24. You think? Yeah. I mean, th- like, he had a chance to win at Richmond last year. I think in the spring, and they wrecked down in turn one and two on a late restart. I think that's when Larson ended up winning. Josh Berry. Finished, I think, third or fourth that night in the mm-hmm. 48, or maybe the second. He finished really well. So I, I expect Josh to do well, too, because it's a short track. Um, but, yeah, I'm going with the 24. Cause Momentum's I'm, a real thing. Yeah. No, Momentum. winning is contagious. It is. And I, I think the one the one wild card in this situation is racing at night. We haven't raced oh. this car at night. Yeah, you're right. So from the daytime to night, Richmond is one of those places that can really flip the field. Um, so we'll have to see what happens with these cars at night because uh, the broadcast doesn't even start until like seven o'clock. That's right. You know, a little after night seven. Race. So, so I think having a night race at Richmond still, still going to be fairly cool, but it was, um, a lot of times you'd go there and practice during the day and it would totally flip who the, who the car to beat was when it came nighttime. Do you remember, do you guys remember when it used to be the spot where every like rookie would make their start. Yeah, oh yeah. Like in the Xfinity series. And they always would run like top ten there for whatever reason. Like Johanna Long even ran like top ten in that 70 <laughs> yeah. car. Like it was, yeah. it was so cool for that. Yeah. I love this time. So I was looking at the numbers for this and Joe Gibbs Racing, obviously our pick is a JGR driver. 18 wins there over the years. Yes. What do you think? Like, how is that possible? Like some teams just seem to really get a place and and Make it happen I, for years. I think that, uh, you know, that started with Tony Stewart. And you you say, well, it's just because their cars make a lot of grip. And that's not really what Richmond used to be. It used to be sealer. And and now it's worn out. And, and you know, you have to have a grippy race car. And I think it fits into a lot of the style of of their setups and short track and, and all, the, all the things that they do. But when you go back and look at Joe Gibbs Racing, whether it's Richmond, Martinsville, uh, Bristol kind of falls into a, eh, a little different, right? yeah, a little different, but I mean, Denny Hamlin did just win there. So I think that the Gibbs short track stuff has been good for a number of years. And, and I think you'll see the, it's made a lot of the, the young drivers and veteran drivers on Saturday look really good in, in their Xfinity cars as well. So, um, Joe Gibbs racing will be, they'll be tough to beat. Mm-hmm. All right, two votes of confidence for Martin Truex Jr. out there at Richmond Raceway. Can't wait to see how it all unfolds. All right, time now for for your stuff. What you got there, Mamba? Segment of the week. Let's go. (laughs) All right. Kevin kind of talked about it a little bit. Something happened in the truck race that we have (laughs) never seen before. We've had loose wheels 
We've had rear ends come out. We've never had the rear end come housing. out with the wheels. I don't think. <laughs> the, the, the rear end housing, okay. the truck arms are still attached to it. The U-bolts are still on it, um, but the truck arms are broken. That is unbelievable. Yeah, so I immediately took a screenshot and sent it to Kevin. I'm like, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know where this <laughs> happens because the U-bolt where the truck arm goes, which the truck arms are still in the truck, the U-bolts are still in it. Yeah, the truck arms are just broke. And that's uh, Marco Andretti. Andretti. And so here's my theory in, in this. I'm going to guess that that truck was probably wheel hopped over a hundred times <laughs> during the race. <laughs> and I think that the truck arms probably got to the point of just being we're, fatigued. We're done. Yeah. Um, Gave because up. <laughs> the, 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 the things that, that Marco has, has raced, and we talked about this earlier, didn't, don't have wheel hop. And right. his experience with wheel hop is, well, I don't know what that is, but I'm going to keep driving it into the corner. And, and that, that, I guess that is what it is. Well, um, he, he, he definitely fatigued a new part that, that I oh, had real. never yeah. seen yeah. broke. And so NASCAR, I believe, took all that back to make sure I'm that sure. the truck arms and everything were, were legal. But I, I have to believe that that was just um, a case of, of not really knowing exactly what's going on in, in this style of car with the wheel hop in the back. And uh, you only want to do that maybe once or twice. I, I would be willing to bet that there was a lot done every lap. Mm. But right. that was just that's just a guess. <laughs> I'm glad he did it no idea. He, I'm glad he did it where he did, because we had a, a Fox camera perfectly positioned this, know, to get quite the all footage. the angles of it so you yeah, can really look fantastic. at it. Uh, another thing that happened is SVG is an animal. <laughs> He's a dog. And he pulled a move off that I've never seen before. He did a crossover move on Ty Gibbs right here, entering turn one. And he didn't run into him. Like it was like he it was like a perfectly, perfectly timed pass. But Ty had was passing him. Yeah. And they come out the other side and now SVG is right back where he was before. And yeah. Him. And I was in the in the TV production truck watching the race and I actually stood up and I was like, I couldn't really yell and say <laughs> and, and and say what I how cool it was and excited I was because I would have affected the broadcast at that particular <laughs> point. But that was definitely one of the cooler moves. And I actually saw Ross Chastain try to do it the next day. How'd that work? Well, I mean, he, he kind of pulled it off, <laughs> yeah. but he didn't, I mean, he didn't finish the pass, but he pulled it off. Same type of deal where he just released the brake and crossed them over. Um, but I think that's, that's what happens in our, in our, in our series in in our sport, you see somebody do that and it opens up everybody's mind to say, Oh, I like oh, that. I, like that. I want to try that. That's what happened last weekend <laughs> at, at Coda with, yep. with Tyler Reddick, right? Everybody's gone back and say, okay, well, why is Tyler Reddick so fast at Coda? And they've studied, worked on their car and studied and worked on their car. And, and that's the same thing they'll do with SVG. They'll look at moves like that and then it'll just open every, broaden everybody's horizon to say, ah, I can do something different in this car when I'm passing. It's not just about, you know, the standard drive in deep. It was, that was a very, very cool technique. Makes me think of the Ross Chastain move. How many people wanted to How replicate many, that after before that worked. NASCAR yeah. put the end to that? <laughs> it remind, it, Kevin used to do that with the when we won the championship, and you could see in the telemetry, you would use the way you use the brakes. Mm -hmm. No one else was using the brakes the way like he would use the brake like almost all the way through the corner and then be back in the gap. Like just the way you were using your footwork, no one else was doing that. So that's what that reminds yeah. me of. That was cool. Move. That, that was a super cool move. SVG. What a move. Um, and lastly, but not least, it is bracket time. It is March Madness in basketball. Best time in college basketball. Denny Hamlin talked about a bracket last year. And I want to know, do you think we should do it? And how would you like that to account? So you're talking like a breakout bracket like they do in the NBA? Kind of like an in -turn tournament, in-season tournament. Yeah. S same situation. I think we should. I think it's a great idea. A one -on -one. I, think, I think we could, um, I think we could have some sort of bracket system for, I, I don't know, how many races would that be? We could, I mean. You could make it however many races you wanted it, to. Yeah. Yeah. It could be. Well, you'd have to start with 36, 18. Who's going to get the bye week the next week? I guess it'd be four. It depends on your. Uh, points position, yeah. getting into it, because it, that's how you seed them. That's how you seed them. And I think then, it would be a great promotion. I guess it'd only be let's do four it. rounds. Or can you find us a sponsor? <laughs> I'm sure I can. We could probably convince somebody around here that we should we should create this bracket system for next year. We should at least yeah. do it. We could at least do it for funsies on on Fox, we could right? We could yes, do it for, for funsies sure. and just see what it would look like. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a. I think it's a. As you would say, funsy thing. 
Funsies? Yeah, it's, he, it's definitely a funsies. Is that his word of the week, funsies? You might have to like, use funsies. Can you imagine <laughs> funsies? <laughs> oh, boy. Hey, yeah. yeah, you're coming up with good ideas here on this show. For, I like that. For NASCAR to be listening to. I like it. Bracket. Thanks, guys. I yeah. appreciate yeah. that. Good, usually, good they're, usually they're dogging me out. Good Today, work out of you, Mamba. <laughs> okay, so it's about time for Last Call. And you've got another show, though, of course, this week. Yes. Uh, you want to tell us about it? Yes, so we sat down with Denny Hamlin this week, and um, what a great interview. We, we played a little bit <laughs> uh, on the pre-race, just talking about his his win last week at, at Bristol a little bit. Um, but we had almost an hour conversation wow. just about stuff. <laughs> and I think this is definitely the most interesting interview that we've that we've done so far. Uh, to to play on on Thursday, uh, we we played uh, we played the we already played this piece, but he told the story about his first car, and it was a Ford Ranger, and he chopped it, lowered it, uh, he wanted to be on whatever low low truck magazine or whatever magazine <laughs> it was. Well, he got a little little clip into it, and he winds up crashing this thing into mm. the back of a school bus. Classic. Oh so boy, it was um it, it's a great conversation. We had a lot of fun. We appreciate Denny doing that and taking the time to do that because it makes for uh, makes for a great Thursday. Yes, it does. We always look forward to your interviews. Yes. You do a great job with them. So I kind of w- jumped the gun because I got the picks already. So for last call today, just what are you most looking forward to about the weekend in Richmond? I'm doing driver intro, so I'm back. Ooh. I'm back doing driver intro. Nerd alert! You got to do the big nerd of the so, week. So yeah, yeah. Will, let's will, talk about that. this. Okay. Oh here boy, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I have an idea. Uh, this oh. is dangerous. I like it when I have ideas for you. <laughs> yes. So it's this. a special weekend, and and you are doing driver intros. Is there any way that we can get you to wear an Easter bunny suit? Ooh. On the stage. We last week we talked about onesies. Okay. Right? I, I mean, bunnies. you have a lot of cool apparel. But maybe we could maybe we could just get you some sort of uh, Easter bunny <laughs> Easter okay. bunny outfit. Easter ears. Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> How, we need to have our, our producers clip this, and if this video gets six hundred retweets, I'll do it. Ooh. What video? This video. They're gonna 600 clip. Six hundred retweets. We can see that, Mamba. Okay, in a bunny so suit. what you're saying is. All we need to do is get 600 retweets, and you're going to dress up as the Easter Bunny. I will do Sounds it. You like got to buy it. You got to buy the costume. Oh, well, today's I, Tuesday. Well, okay. Amazon. They got, yeah, you they got Amazon stores that. in. They got stores in Richmond. And you're going to wear the Easter Bunny outfit on the stage during driver intros. Love yeah. it. Whatever you buy, I will. Right. I will. Whatever you buy, I will wear. He said. Deal. All right. 600. Yeah. I think okay. for my last call, I'm most looking forward to seeing how this plays out. What, what do you <laughs> so what think? you're saying is you're looking forward to seeing him in the Easter Bunny Exactly. I, don't, I, I think for, for me, it's, it's uh, can anybody break up the Hendrick and Gibbs train? Mm-hmm. Uh, Richmond is a, is a place that, that they've won a ton of races at as a company. And I just, I don't see anybody to do it. The Fords are garbage uh, currently. <laughs> God. And, um, <laughs> I, I, how else would you explain it? Boy. Especially, Tell me, use, give me a different word. Hot garbage. Hot garbage. Yeah. No. yeah. And, and a variation. It, yeah. This is one of Joey Logano's. It's been a great racetrack for Joey. But do, does he have a race car to actually get up there and do mm-hmm. what he needs to do to, to perform? Same thing with, with Chris Buescher and Brad Keselowski. If they don't show up at the front of the pack this week, I'm highly concerned because everything that okay. they have done to this point is outside of you know qualifying has yeah. not been good. The last month has been terrible uh for for those cars and, and i think if if they don't show up this weekend i'm highly concerned yeah, the highly only, concerned the only driver. one that's been like kind of there and we only talk we've talked about him a couple of times is blaney seems to find a right. way to finish well like he fin- he finished second in a stage and finished 12th but for the level that right. that team is at and the caliber the championship caliber yeah um i mean they're fighting for their life to 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 finish where they do and overachieving in in my opinion. And I just, I'm worried about, I'm worried about the car and, and what they have to compete against the, the Toyotas and Chevrolets, because right now they haven't shown anything. Once we left Atlanta, um, Daytona, they, they controlled the race, but didn't get the finishes. But outside of that, I haven't seen anything after they got, after they got busted with a rear end at Richmond. 
that whole deal wasn't the same. They got busted a few years ago before we switched the car. Mm. And then they just haven't had the speed at Richmond kind of since. So hopefully they can turn that around. Can't wait yeah. to see how it all goes down in the Virginia is for lovers state. You know, <laughs> Virginians, you know. All right. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on X, inter- Instagram, Facebook, all the places. Harvick Happy Pod. We'll see you next week.